We are absolutely thrilled and proud that you could be with us today. Um, without a doubt, the Hispanic vote is going to be consequential in this very defining and historic election. Equally as important, it's going to be what kind of conversation and agenda and policies we are driving within our community. What is the dialogue and the discourse that we are having about those important issues that I think impact uh, Americans uh, across the land, with particular, I think, uh, uh, focus on, on our own Hispanic community? And I'm often asked, you know, well, why, just, uh, why are you just speaking to Hispanic and Latinos? And the answer is, you know, as a community, disproportionately, we are being impacted by the policies uh, that are coming from the federal and state and local level every day. And we are the ones who are most worse off. If you take a look at you know, some of the stats, one out of every four Hispanics today live under the poverty level, while one out of every six other Americans live under the poverty level. 5.1 million children in 2009 in the Hispanic community lived under the poverty level. Today, it's 6.3. So the numbers are rising in poverty. Unemployment has stagnated. 45 straight months of above 10% unemployment in the Hispanic community. It's unacceptable. So the reason we're here today is to have that discourse, that dialogue. What are the policies that are generating prosperity? What are the policies that are generating real growth, jobs for all Americans? And in, in converse, what are those policies that are actually generating dependency, poverty? So um, we've invited uh, some great people, very distinguished leaders within our own uh, community. And uh, I want to thank all of you who are here today, because in, 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 um, in a different way, all the people represented here um, are also leaders in their community. You are the voice, sometimes, to the voiceless. Each one of you here today, in your own way, have to rise up in your communities and be that voice. And so what, what is the agenda that we are promoting? And that's the discussion. Quiero decir muy breve en español um, que estoy muy agradecido con esas personas que están hoy aquí en día. Eh, a nosotros nos importa lo que es avanzar, lo que es un diálogo, eh, una discusión sobre esas políticas en nuestra comunidad al nivel federal, estatal y local ¿Qué son esas políticas que están generando la prosperidad? ¿Qué son esas políticas que están generando trabajos, crecimiento en la economía? ¿Y qué son esas políticas que también están uh, generando eh, la pobreza? Entonces, eh, queremos tener una conversación honesta, eh, una co conversación donde todo se, se pone sobre la mesa y, y llegar a, a, a esas soluciones, porque sabemos que estas elecciones van a ser consecuentes, van a ser elementales, o sea, van a definir el camino que va a tomar nuestro país. Entonces le he pedido a, a distinguidos miembros de la comunidad hispana para que vengan con nosotros y formen parte. Para hacerlo, to do this, uh, uh, we are thrilled to have Univision. Univision, without a doubt, has risen as one of probably the most important and, and fundamental voices we have in our own community uh, on advancing uh, those priority issues within our Hispanic community. And they do it through um, uh, excellent quality programming. But talent, like the person who's going to join me today, uh, I am proud uh, to um, introduce Teresa Rodriguez, a, an admired and respected journalist who's going to join me today. Thank you so much. Gracias a todos. Let me give this man a big hug. Okay. Gracias. Sí, I guess I'm going to take my place back here. No? Antes que nada, muy buenos días. Bienvenidos. Bienvenidos. Good morning. Good morning. I know that there may be some of you in the audience who do not habla español, but you're going to after this is all over. <laughs> anyway, it is actually uh, a pleasure and an honor to be here today in our partnership with Libre. Yes. And uh, we hope that this is the beginning of many conversations to come. We know that we as Hispanics will determine the future of this country. So I hope that you will be uh, engaged in the conversation. We have excellent panelists. And I do have some prepared words, so if you don't mind. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, our participation today is an extension of our Ya Es Hora Civic Participation Initiative. For the 2012 U.S. election cycle, Univision launched Ya Es Hora, Libera Tu Voz, the company's first ever bilingual initiative to engage Latinos eligible to vote in the United States to register and 
participate in the upcoming elections. The multi-layered campaign is designed to educate the Hispanic community on the importance of its role in the upcoming elections and encourage voters to make a difference for themselves and their families. Now, for those of you who have met or worked with Daniel Garza, Jose Maella, and the team from Libre, you know uh, that they want to be sure we do have a meaningful and an interactive discussion. And that's why today we will conduct this in both English y en español. La conversación será en ambos idiomas. La presentación la hemos hecho para que todo el mundo comprenda, ¿no? Un poquito en inglés, un poquito en español. Y también vamos a invitar, eh, vamos a, invitar a los medios sociales. Ya tenemos preguntas que han estado entrando a través de, de la página de Libre mm -hmm. para que participen esas personas que también tienen sus preocupaciones. Y sus preguntas. So we're going to have questions also from social media, uh, and we already do have some that have been coming in through through your website. So those will be included uh, to the panelists. Now we all know the numbers. Hispanic represent more than 52 million people in this country, and a one trillion dollar economy. One trillion dollar economy. That's a lot of purchasing power. The Hispanic entrepreneur spirit is strong. In fact, according to the Kaufman Index of entrepreneurial activity, Hispanics are the most entrepreneurial ethnic group in the country. So all those mom and pop businesses, you know, they do succeed. And that's how it all begins. That's how the American dream many times begins. There are more than two million Hispanic owned businesses in this country, creating jobs and generating nearly $275 billion in revenues. Clearly, the economic and financial potential is high, and the decisions made at the voting poll will impact the opportunities for our community and for our country. For the past few days, we've seen, we've heard multiple discussions about Hispanics in this country. There's a reason for that. Hispanics will decide the election this year as more than 12 million Hispanics turn out to vote. En los últimos días hemos escuchado mucha, eh, muchos paneles eh, hablar acerca de la importancia del voto hispano ¿Y por qué estamos aquí? ¿Por qué estamos hablando de educación, de la economía, de inmigración, de los temas que afectan a muchos latinos en este país? El simple hecho es muy simple, ¿no? Este año uh, saldrán a las urnas más de 12 millones de hispanos que van a determinar estas elecciones presidenciales. Y por eso es que hoy Daniel y yo vamos a moderar este panel y tenemos con nosotros a cuatro panelistas, very four distinguished leaders, who will be discussing these important topics. A lot of them are dear friends as well. Right? You know for many years. We oh, yes. How many, but we've known them for many years. <laughs> Amigos, conocemos muchos años. Empezamos con, as we call your name, I know you're in the middle of lunch, but can you come up and take your seats as we call your name? Empezamos con el congresista Raúl Labrador, representando el estado de Idaho, originalmente de Puerto Rico. Congressman Raúl Labrador. I had the honor yeah, of working with this gentleman. Welcome. Bienvenido nuevamente. At another panel earlier this week, and he talked uh, about his mom and how she was uh, an example in his life to succeed. We also have another dear friend, Rosario Marin, former U.S. <laughs> Treasurer de la Ciudad de México. <laughs> <laughs> Bienvenida. Otro gran amigo, el congresista Mario Díaz Balart, cubano y de la Florida. <laughs> and Leslie Sanchez, political analyst and author Tejana, representing the U.S. contingency, being that we have Cuba, Puerto Rico, and we have. <laughs> And Mexico, so here we go. We're no, all complete now. <laughs> How about a big round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. So, get a clue. Yes, Okay. The Labor Department announced the job numbers for July, showing that unemployment rates remained unchanged at 8.3% throughout the country, 11% for the Hispanic community. You know what, Rosario? Como tú no tienes pelos en la lengua, voy a empezar contigo. ¿Qué te parece? Ya me conoce. Do you want me to do it in Spanish? Uh, you can do both. If you'd like to use Spanglish, that's okay. But we do have Spanish media, so if you'd like to, and English, address both. No. Why is the Hispanic community so disproportionately affected? You know, it's, um, 
it's actually really tragic when we think about it. Um, this is the most faithful community, uh, the one that works so hard. We have the strongest work ethic. And yet, the policies that this president has advanced have left us with the steady unemployment at the highest levels for 45 uh, straight months. This is just simply unacceptable. And why is it? Um, many people, when they are unemployed, they go out there and try to look for their own job. They, they try, they try to figure out how, como darle de comer a sus hijos. Mm -hmm. That's bottom line, you know. Um, but this president has advanced the policies that have really made it so difficult for people to start their job, uh, to start their business. Um, people are very afraid, and I know we're gonna talk about that later on. But um, companies that would hire people are afraid to hire people. They don't know what's going to happen. And because they don't know what's going to happen and how much money they're going to have to uh, pay taxes and their regulations, they stop hiring. And we have a, an economic recovery without, without uh, lowering the, the, the unemployment rate. I've never heard that. That's not an econ economic recovery. And so, um, as sad as it is, you know, there is hope, and that hope is coming, and it's coming on November the 2nd. Thank you very much. And me gustaría seguir con el congresista Mario Díaz Valar. ¿Qué ha hecho el Congreso para mejorar el estado de la economía? Teresa, si me permite antes, qué privilegio estar con este grupo de personas que yo tanto admiro. Eh, Daniel, gracias por esta oportunidad. Y Teresa, que obviamente ahora es una figura nacional, pero es de Miami, ¿eh? <laughs> Así que, uh, what a privilege. You know, it's interesting. We, we in the House uh, understand some pretty basic principles. What creates wealth, what creates opportunity, is not having a big, bigger, more expensive federal bureaucracy. It's businesses. It's the American entrepreneurial spirit. So what have we done in the House? We started doing this very early on. We started passing, and we passing, not proposing, proposing and passing legislation that would immediately get this economy going. By the way, that's what the president said he was going to do. Remember that? He said that, you know, that was job number one, and then he started doing everything else, everything else that has made the economy much worse. We, have, we passed about 30 bills out of the House dealing with such things as regulation reform to get the federal government to, this. to stop new regulations that is inhibiting job creation, uh, reforming, and, and finally making sure that the United States that has more energy. We Think about this. We have more oil, more natural gas, more coal, more energy than Saudi Arabia. But we're not allowed by federal law to tap into it. Mm -hmm. So we passed legislation so that we can become energy energy independence that would create millions of jobs and would start to stop the exportations of billions of, of, of the uh, outsourcing of billions of American dollars going to places like Hugo Chavez and the Middle East. We did tax reform to incentivize small, mid-sized businesses, entrepreneurs to create businesses. I could go on forever. Again, it's over 30 bills. But what happened? The Senate refuse to even take them up to debate them. They refuse to even talk about them. Well, that shouldn't surprise us. Remember, the Senate has yet to even pass a budget in over three years. So, no, the House is active. We're ready to go. Mm -hmm. And here's the difference. Tenemos un presidente de la Casa Blanca. Aprobó su plan económico en su totalidad. Y la economía mejoró. No, la economía empeoró. Empeoró. ¿Y ahora qué propone ahora? Las mismas propuestas para empeor, empeorar aún más la economía. Esta es la pregunta. Si estamos satisfechos y queremos que nuestros hijos y nuestros nietos se críen en una economía con la que, como la que tenemos hoy, donde no hay empleos, donde no hay oportunidad, entonces podemos regir al presidente Obama. Pero si queremos que nuestros hijos y nuestros nietos se críen en la tierra de la oportunidad, en donde todo el mundo puede encontrar un trabajo, donde todo el mundo puede dejar un futuro mejor para sus hijos y sus nietos. Es muy fácil. Solamente tenemos que hacer una cosa, cambiar 
a los que están creando este problema y reemplazarlos con dos personas que saben cómo funciona la economía. Mitt Romney y Paul Ryan van a traer de vuelta a los Estados Unidos que nos trajo a este gran país. Um, we're absolutely, uh, absolutely thrilled to have members of Congress here because, of course, you represent us in Congress and you have to make a deciding vote after you gather all the information and make a, a, uh, one of those judgment calls. Now, uh, b before I ask a question to Congressman Labrador, I also want to point out that we have Congressman David Rivera from Florida here. Um, so, uh, we thank you for the hard work that you are, are always doing. We know that you guys run, have very busy schedules. And, um, but at the core of it, Congressman uh, Labrador, your decisions are about incentives. What incentives are you creating for business people to either launch a new business, risk their capital, or take it to the next level? And, and in contrast to that, what incentives are you creating that actually maybe even tightens the, the job market or um, people are afraid uh, to, to, to launch into these businesses. What has happened in Congress, uh, in your estimation, that, that has uh, increased incentives to, for growth? In the last four years, absolutely nothing. And that's the problem. That's why we have the economy that we have today. We, we're dealing with Democrats in Washington, D.C. that really believe differently than we do about how the economy works, how things happen in, in private enterprise. And I'm just going to give you one example. When I was in Congress for just a month, I'm, I'm a freshman, so this is my first term in Congress. I was in Congress for only a month, and we held a hearing in the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. In that committee, we had three business people and one regulator. These three business people were begging us, please stop making new regulations. Every time you make a new regulation, I have to redo everything I'm doing in my business. Every time Washington, D.C. gives us a new mandate, we have to change everything we do in our business. In fact, these business people were saying, don't even lower our taxes. Leave our taxes where they are. Just don't give us any new regulations. You had three business people saying that. The regulator from Washington, D.C. said, these guys don't know what they're talking about. New regulations create new employment. <laughs> And I was shocked, and I just thought, wait a second, how is it that regulations make new employment? Government. And guess what their answer was? Well, every time we have a new regulation, the companies have to hire a new regulator. They have to hire a new compliance officer. So every time we do this in Washington, D.C., we're actually encouraging businesses to hire more people. That is a mindset in Washington, D.C. They don't understand the difference between productive work and non-productive work. A productive employee will create more business, will create more money, will create more capital that people can invest in. A regulator creates absolutely nothing but paperwork. But in Washington, D.C., they believe that those two employees are exactly the same person. And that's so ridiculous. I was a small business owner. I know how government works because I've been also in the legislature and Congress, but I also know how business works. You have somebody in Barack Obama who has never heard, uh, heard of a private sector job, doesn't understand how the economy works, doesn't understand the things that we need to do. There's three simple things that we need to do. We need to have tax reform. We need to have regulatory reform, and we need to advocate for energy independence. If we did those three things today, if we were able to, to work together with the Democrats in the Senate, we would have unprecedented economic growth. But for whatever reason, the, Senate, the Democrats in the Senate don't want to work with us on these issues. And I think that's what's stifling the economy and is preventing businesses from hiring. I have two businesses in Idaho. We, Idaho is a small state population-wise. We only have about 1.4 million people in Idaho. Two businesses that want to invest in Idaho right now, they want to spend over $100 million in Idaho, but they're waiting because they're saying the regulatory burden is so high that if they do not have a change in the economy, they don't have a change in the government, they're going to have to invest abroad. What are they going to take abroad? They're going to take their hundreds of millions of dollars, and they're going to take jobs. They're going to take all those things. So we need to find a way to change that here, and we can do that in Washington, D.C., but you need to do that by electing Romney and Ryan. Mm -hmm. okay. Leslie, we've heard all the different points of view. We've heard some ideas for solutions. Would raising taxes on businesses, <clears throat> excuse me, would raising taxes on businesses optimally benefit those below the poverty line? 
no. <laughs> because they won't, you know, uh, they won't have a job. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, ultimately, that it, it's, it's simple economics. You know, it's interesting. It, I think the car, we have to applaud. It, it's such a pleasure to hear the congressman, and, and they are so much on the front lines of the battle that happens legislatively that we do not hear about, and that regulatory battle that happens because you fundamentally have a, a kind of a European-style government that wants mm -hmm. to move toward expansion of public sector jobs. I think the president has done exactly what he said he was going to do with respect to let's grow the public sector. Yeah. Number of IRS agents needed to facilitate the new health care law. The number of people and the regulators that need to go and ensure that these businesses are adhering to these new changes. And that stifles free enterprise and that stifles the ability of small businesses. And there's a very interesting statistic that supports that. When you look at the number of immigrants, over 50% of, of, of the new small business growth in states like California, Texas, New York is from immigrants. It is the immigrant community that is trying to pick themselves up one step at a time. They're trying to navigate not only things like, you know, how to be a good steward, a good citizen, a good responsible person in your family, but navigate the school systems, which many just fundamentally don't understand that bureaucracy, but trying to have a business on top of that and provide for their families as well. Because the core of that is that, it, which is why, believe it, that, that video was very interesting. It hit the nerve, the undercurrent. The undercurrent is that we are looking for self-responsibility and just the opportunity to do that. But as we stifle that, it does have those remnants of other Latin American countries that has stifled the ability to do either have economic or political freedom. So um, there is a very real debate that these members are engaging in. And that's why when in our polling, you're seeing a funny thing that comes up only in Latino research more than non-Hispanic white research, and with that is that the concern about the rising debt, the, the concern about this vast spending and regulation, because they said that immediately the Mexicanos think, oh, you know, Mexicano-Americanos, they think um, devaluation of the currency, or people think that you know, run on the banks. Um, these are very serious uh, generational concerns mm -hmm. that, that Latin Americans and Hispanic Americans have in our country. Tesorero Marín, um, ¿qué le parece en español? Que, que según el argumento es de que si le aumentamos los impuestos a, los, a las pequeñas empresas o a los negociantes y comerciantes, eh, que eso va a mejorar la economía para los, el resto. No, eso es una verdadera mentira. Lo hemos visto. Una de las cosas cuando nosotros entramos en la Casa Blanca, lo que nos, nos dimos cuenta y el presidente hizo, lo primero que él hizo, porque cuando nosotros entramos y la gente se ha olvidado completamente de esto, eh. cuando el presidente Bush en el 2000 entró, ya entrábamos en una recesión. Y la gente se le ha olvidado eso. Cuando él entró, lo primero que hizo, la primera legislación, fue reducir los impuestos. Ahora, el proceso legislativo toma tiempo y esos iban a, a venir a, a tomar efecto en octubre. Cuando tuvimos el, el septiembre 11, gracias a Dios que en octubre iban a tomar este, el eh, efecto, la, la reducción de los impuestos. Si no, ese problema que tuvimos tan grave, económico, el hit que tuvimos en la economía del país, a, des, después de septiembre, donde se perdió un trillón de dólares en la economía del país en un día. Si no hubieran entrado en efecto las, el, la reducción de los impuestos, hubiéramos, entrado, eh, hubiéramos continuado una segunda recesión, hubiéramos entrado en una depresión, entonces, lo, nosotros sabemos, nosotros sabemos que cuando se reducen los impuestos, la economía florece, porque hay más dinero en, que las los, que los, uh, personas tienen en sus bolsillos, hay más dinero que el, los empleadores, que las fábricas tienen en los bolsillos. Eso, cuando hay más dinero, pues se crean los empleos. Cuando, por el contrario, cuando a, eh, aumentan los impuestos hay menos dinero que, que se gastan, hay más dinero que está en los bolsillos. Eso no genera empleos. Tal vez genera empleos en el sector público, tal vez, pero el sector público solamente crea un pequeñísimo número de, de empleos. Los que crean los empleos es la empresa privada, es el pequeño em, 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 emprendedor. Esos son los que crean empleos. Y es fundamentalmente una... Una decisión que nosotros queremos, que debemos uh, tener, se, se esclarece aquí qué es lo que le beneficia a la comunidad latina. Y a la comunidad latina lo que le beneficia es tener los, los impuestos más bajos. Eso está comprobado. 
eso no, se, no hay ni que discutirlo. Y si en cambio tenemos personas que nos quieren llevar a un lugar de dependencia donde es el gobierno el que te está dando. Nosotros no venimos a, pe a pedir, nosotros venimos a dar, nosotros venimos a contribuir, nosotros venimos... Miren, a mí me, 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 se me está enchinando el cuero, el cuerito aquí. Nada más de pensar que la gente vino a este país escapando este, la dependencia de, de sus países, que vienen aquí a contribuir, que vienen aquí a, a dar. Y ahorita lo que estamos viendo es la pobreza inaceptable dentro de nuestra comunidad. Imagínense que los latinos se ponen a pedir welfare. ¿Cómo welfare los latinos? La, el número más grande jamás visto en la historia de latinos en welfare. Lo que ellos quieren no es un cheque de welfare. Denle mi cheque de mi trabajo. Yo lo quiero ganar. Yo me quiero ganar. Esta es la dignidad mía. El trabajo dignifica al hombre. Eso crecimos con eso. Y sin embargo, aquí este gobierno lo único que quiere dar es un cheque de desempleo, un cheque de las food stamps. Un... Pero a eso no venimos aquí. Denme, pero denme la oportunidad. Eso es a lo que venimos. Se me enchina el cuerpo. I want to address that really because it's so important for people to understand, especially the Hispanic community. And when you raise taxes, you increase social welfare and you increase government dependency, but you actually stifle economic growth. The only way the Hispanic community is going to get ahead is if we have more economic growth. Every study has shown that an increase in taxes actually decreases economic growth. You have less economic growth when you do that. And that's what the Democrats want. The Democrats want more social welfare, more dependency on the government, and they don't want people to rely so much on themselves. It's been clear. It's been clear. It's, a, it's a two different paths that the American people want. Just look at one simple statistic. There was a bunch of Republican governors that were elected, among them Susana Martinez in New Mexico, a bunch of Republican governors that were elected in 2010. There was a recent study that shows that the Republican governors have 1% less unemployment. In the states where we have Republicans in the, in, in the governor's mansion, you have 1% less unemployment than in the states that you have Democratic governors. I mean, that's just the facts speak for themselves. And Teresa, when we, when we were with Jeb Bush the other mm -hmm. day, he said something that was so important, and it's just stuck with me this whole week. Policies matter. You know, the, the Democrats keep saying that they care about the Hispanic community. They may care about them, but the policies of the, Hispa of the Democratic Party are actually stifling economic growth for the Hispanic community. You have more unemployment in the Hispanic community. You have more people on welfare. So policies do matter, and the policies of the Republican Party actually bring the Hispanic community forward. They bring them out of poverty, and they make them better and less dependent on the government. Okay, can I just say something? Of course. Because he just said something that just burns me when they talk about caring and compassion, mm -hmm. because they are so compassionate. They're going to give you the fish. Le vamos a dar el pescado. Le vamos a dar el welfare. Because we're so compassionate. That's what the Democrats say. Let's, what is more compassionate than giving them a job? That's more compassion. Teach them how to fish. Enseñales a pescar. Porque si no, lo que vas a crear es una serie de dependencia de la que estamos hablando. Really, who cares more about the Latino community? The one that continually gives you the fish or the one that teaches you, that enables you, that promotes you, that encourages you to learn to fish. Gracias, profesor. Ya, no voy a decir nada. Sí. Y hablando de enseñar ¿no? a pescar y preparar a esa juventud para un mejor futuro, ¿no? la educación es clave. Y queremos ahora eh, compartir con ustedes una pregunta y cualquiera de ustedes puede contestar, el que primero quiera. ¿no? Esto vino a través de social media. Matt Castillo pregunta, ¿cómo, ¿qué papel juega la educación en la libertad económica? How does education play a role in economic freedom? ¿Quién quisiera contestar? Es Hemos todo. estado hablando de varios es factores ya, es pero sabemos que la educación es clave. Es todo, es todo, es la oportunidad, es la, 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 lo que abre la puerta a la oportunidad. Y esta es la ironía. Esta administración ha llevado al borde de la bancarrota a los Estados Unidos de América. Es increíble. Piensen eso. Los Estados Unidos de América 
este imperio económico, lo han, nos han llevado al borde de la bancarrota. Y por la política de esta administración, si seguimos así, no va a haber un centavo para financiar educación. No va a haber un centavo para financiar las carreteras. No va a haber un, un centavo para ayudar a las personas que realmente le hace falta ayuda. Porque todo el dinero va a ir a financiar la burocracia del gobierno federal y los intereses, porque todo ese dinero es prestado. Entonces, la educación es clave. A mí cuando me vienen a ver, y muchas personas, y nos reunimos con ellos y hablamos de educación, les recuerdo que si queremos poder financiar las cosas esenciales, esenciales como la educación, tenemos que evitar que los Estados Unidos vayan a la bancarrota. Y estamos al borde de la bancarrota. Pensar que por primera vez en la historia de los Estados Unidos, la deuda de los Estados Unidos, los que prestan, nos han reducido. O sea, la calidad de crédito. Calidad de crédito. Primera vez en la historia de los Estados Unidos. You know, if we want to fund the things that are essential, the fe we're talking about education, which is such an important, that, that opens all the doors, huh? But if we want to be able to continue to do the things that are essential, you know, national security, defense, transportation, education, we have to stop from bankrupting the United States of America. So, you know, they believe that the way to solve all the problems is to increase the federal bureaucracy, take more money from people, increase bureaucracy, take more money from people, and then borrow money, because even then, they want to raise taxes, that's not enough for them, because they want more bureaucracy. So then they need to borrow more money, mostly from communist China. We believe a couple of pretty essential things. Number one is, you know, not rocket science. Stop spending money you just don't have. Stop increasing the level of poverty. Because when, when a little while ago you talked about the level of poverty, how it's increased mm -hmm. in our community, you know what's adding insult to injury? We're increasing the level of poverty particular to our children. And then you know what we're doing? We're adding thousands of dollars to their credit card bill, which now those children that are poor are going to have to pay for the rest of their life. This is not rocket science. You can't continue to borrow to spend money you just don't have. You can't continue to create a, bitter, a larger federal bureaucracy while the private sector continues to shrink. You can't continue to destroy our, our military while the world becomes more dangerous. You know, there's a point when you think, they must have gotten something right. They must have gotten something right. I'll keep thinking about what that may be. On <laughs> speech. <laughs> I'm thinking. Leslie, Leslie. Help me out here. Yeah. Help me out here. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. OK, let's think. <laughs> How long is this program? This, stay, this may take a while. <laughs> Leslie, uh, the congressman actually mentioned that we need to increase energy production. Uh, both congressmen actually made references to that. The, the Obama administration actually bet big on green energy, particularly one company in California that got a $531 billion uh, bank loan. Um, right. Right. So, so went bankrupt. They didn't Solinda. get that one right either. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Picky favorites is what we call it. And a lot, apparently, there was some discussion about cronyism. In Espanol, se dice amiguismo, people who are well connected are getting the grants, are getting the funding. That's where the, the, uh, most of the stimulus went to. How do we stop this kind of activity? Wait, and this, how bad is it? How, how, how pernicious is it to our society? The, the, the worst part of that whole story is that the, the president ran in 2008 on having more transparency, on ending this kind of Washington cronyism, and came forward and had, you know, and ending the, the ties and the strong kind of revolving door of lobbyists through the White House. So now there's the revolving door at the Caribou Coffee down the street. Um, you know, so the process has remained exactly the same, where the lobbyists are still having tremendous influence. Uh, and where you're also seeing favorites selected, unfortunately, and, and that's the disadvantage to, to everyone, is that the bureaucracies are picking and choosing not only individual companies that are using, using and losing taxpayer dollars, 
but also how they're setting up all these other processes and regulations we talk about repeatedly, because they think this is basically the way that America is, should function. That's inherently wrong for our free enterprise system. And he, I, I do want to kind of harken back briefly on the point of education, because you talked a lot about the bureaucracies, the entrenched <coughs> interests, the lobbyists, and different things. Yes. Interviewing Hispanic families and Latino parents, you will find they, Hispanic families understand the issue of education, mm -hmm. that it is failing Hispanic children all along the education continuum. Then they're wanting to do something about it. So now you hear Latino parents talking about school choice. You know how many years school choice? It's been 20 years, we've been pushing the school choice. But now it's reaching up over 50%. Latino parents are, wait a minute, what is this? I have the option, the choice to send my child, from a bad, pull them out of a bad school and send them to a good school. It's a simple, simple piece of, wait, I have that freedom. The freedom to do that has become extremely important. They want teacher accountability. Wow, how long has it been till we saw teacher accountability spike up, but now you're seeing this kind of resonance and pushing back in these surveys of Hispanic parents saying, hold the teachers accountable. Give me the opportunity to have choice to push against these systems that their children are entrenched in because many cases we're at the lowest performing schools in America. So I, I, I repeatedly, I think that the war for, for these children in, these, in our Hispanic families is, is, is not only on the federal level, it's certainly on the local one. You know, can I, can I be bipartisan for a second? <laughs> sure, <laughs> of course. This is why I'm a conservative first and a Republican second. I'm a conservative first because the cronyism is from both sides. Mm. And this is why Washington is broken, because what you have is a system of dependency for, yes, the lower classes, but you also have a system of dependency for big businesses and other individuals. And what happens with our current tax code and what happens with our regulatory reform, uh, code is that you have a bunch of big people, big businesses that have a lot of money that can come to Washington, D.C., give money to congressmen, and then the congressmen do their bidding. And that needs to stop on both sides. And that's why I'm such an advocate of tax reform, because the tax code is so broken, because it's every time you have a big business or in the regulations, every time there's a special program or something, it's the ones who have friends in Washington who get all the benefits. The rich people do very well under Republicans and Democrats. And what we need is a system where the American people do well and not just a few select that have friends in Washington, D.C. Well, well, we could talk, and going back to education, I could talk about this. Yeah. I mean, this is my pet peeve because I was the first one in my family to graduate with a college education. and. You know, going back and even listening to Condoleezza Rice's, um, you know, uh, a speech last night when she said, although I couldn't sit at that, you know, Walgreens counter and have that hamburger, my parents always told me I could be the president of the United States. I had that. I know you had that with your mother as well. I had that with my parents. You know, born in Cuba, came to this country at nine months of age, and I had that. Uh, and I know education also begins at home, but a lot of parents are now getting that information. O sea, en mi época eso no existía, ¿no? O sea, esa información abierta, ¿no? Eh, y además, la, lo que existía era la filosofía de que tú vas a la escuela a aprender, ¿no? Eh, la educación es de la escuela, es la responsabilidad de la escuela, no de los padres. Y a eso ha ido cambiando y tiene que seguir cambiando. Pero también tenemos que poder informar más a esos padres, sobre todo cuando hay tantas familias que son broken families, que tienen esa ambos trabajando o una madre sola criando a sus hijos, ¿no? Y eso es clave también. Y algo que a mí me preocupa, if I might just stay on education a minute, is that a lot of kids are graduating these days, are not finding a job, have an incredible student loan in front of them. In fact, two out of three do have a loan, an average of 25,000. How do we address that? How do we change that? ¿Quién quiere contestar eso? O sea, muchos jóvenes que se están graduando de la universidad hoy en día, dos de cada tres se gradúan con una deuda de aproximadamente 25 mil dólares. Like ¿No? ¿Qué said, mensaje que like estamos enviando y cómo puede night, cambiar? Sí, tienen el Obama poster en su casa, en sus padres. Así que esto es tan importante para mí. Esto es uno de los problemas que probablemente me más. Estaba tan afortunado que, you know, you know, you heard me tell the story. You know, my mother passed away eight years ago. She was a single mom, and I was her only child. And she dedicated her entire life to me. And as I was listening to Condoleezza Rice, I, I mean, I think about my mom every day, but I was really thinking about my mom last night. 
Every time I told her I wanted to be something, I want to be an astronaut, she said, you can do anything you want. I want to be president, you can do anything you want. I want to be a business owner, you can do anything you want. There was nothing I couldn't do, there was nothing I couldn't become, and it was everything that she taught me as a small child. I grew up in Puerto Rico, I lived there till the age of 13. She went without in her own life, she went without the latest clothes, the latest cars, the latest everything, so she could put me in a private school. She realized as a single mom that I needed discipline in my life, so she put me in a military school for four years until she realized that every day I was lo losing one of my insignias and it was costing her more money for, to, to buy my uniforms than it was costing the education. So then she decided she wanted to put mm -hmm. me to learn English, to learn it well. She put me in a bilingual school where I, could, I spent two years struggling trying to learn English. She did everything for me but she made education a priority in our lives. She never asked the government to do something for her. She decided that if I wanted to be successful, if she wanted me to be successful, she would give it to me. She would give me that success, but most importantly, she would force me and make me study. When I didn't get good grades, I got punished in my home. Mm. When I got in trouble in school, which I did sometimes, I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> I was punished oh. in my home. If I was sent home from school, that meant that I was in my bedroom for three days. It didn't mean that I had a three-day holiday. It meant that I was in trouble without TV, without anything. We need to have real responsibility in the home, and we need to encourage our youth. The only way our young Hispanic people are going to be successful in life is if they get an education, they learn to play by the, to work by the rules. They learn to play hard, and they learn to work hard. These, this is what we have to do. It's the way we're going to be successful. And I'm grateful every day of my life that I had a mother like that. And it's important that we teach our children and we teach our community that that's what they have to do. of the moms, uh, no doubt, and, and I, I, I just wanted to, to mention that one thing we don't hear, I was the former head of uh, Hispanic education in, in the Bush administration, and, and we would laud every time and, and, and champion there was, there was a closing of the achievement gap for Hispanic students, that little that Hispanic fourth grade readers are doing just as well as maybe other readers, because we had so many disadvantages starting when, from pre-K, you know, it started so early in trying to close that education gap, and I just was at the Catholic school at inner, uh, the uh, inner city in, in Los Angeles. It's the highest performing little private school in that area. And now they extended to 11 months of school because they don't summer in Maine. I love that. We don't summer. <laughs> you know, like, you know, every people have a summer. You know, in low income areas, you don't summer. Summer's going like down the street, across the street, or getting in trouble. Um, that's what summer That's what summer is. But one of the moms was there, and it made me think of that. And, she's, and she, I mean, and they, they have this very horrible choice, some of these families, because they only have enough student aid uh, scholarship money. And it's only 1000 a year, which is amazing. But it, uh, you know, for, for, to do so much for these children, and she can't decide between which child she's going to send because mm. of economic circumstances. Mm. But she said she is finding a way to make it work, taking three jobs. Because when she was growing up in the area, she would be in fourth and fifth grade. And the bell would ring, and she would be bullied. And she said, I didn't know. Am I, do I need a knife? How do I get to my next mm. class? And this is very real. I think the fear that these parents have for their children right now, not only in falling through the cracks and dropping out of high school, but the fear and safety and security because of where we live is something we have to be mindful of. And to give that freedom so their parents can decide to send their children to different schools or, or whatever is what we need to empower them with. Can I very briefly? You know, Here's one of the sad things, that what we hear from this administration is that it can't get any better. You know, we hear blame, 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 blame. You know, things are bad now, but it can't get any better, so deal with it. This is the best it's going to get. You know, that's nuts. And for us in Florida, and here we are in Tampa, we don't have to think very hard about that. You want to know what can be done in education? What steps should be taken? How you can improve education? Just look at Jeb Bush. Potentially the best governor the state has ever had. Mm -hmm. Look at the look at the <laughs> look at the reduction in the gap, in the ga achievement gap between minorities and non-minorities under President Bush in a very short period of time. But that's what we hear from this administration and everything. In education, oh excuses, 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 and you know, all these reasons why they can't get any better. 
in our economy. Excuses, excuses, excuses. You know, it's the Europeans' fault. It's the Japanese' fault. It's the, the you know, it's the, the blue moon that passed by Jupiter's fault. I mean, it's <laughs> so many reasons why everything, nothing can get better. And the reality is that it can get better. I think I came up with something that they have been good at. I did. I've been thinking about it. And this, write, it write this down. <laughs> write this down. You know, you know, you know when that, you know when that excuse, when that state of things are bad and they can't get better, when we're in decline and it's other people's fault. Do you remember that happened here before? Jimmy Carter's administration. Remember that? By the way, Americans taken hostage for years. Remember that? We have an American hostage in Cuba since 2009. I mean, history repeats itself, and it couldn't get better. And what an evil person Ronald Reagan was. And the reality is all it took was believing in the American people. And we had the largest economic expansion in recent memory. All it took was a change of leadership. So I did, I did come up with something that, frankly, they've done really well. They've made President Carter's administration look pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> You know, can I say can I say something about education for especially Hispanic families? I, I think it's really sad when I go to high schools and I go to middle schools, I, and I watch these kids who say that they you know they're they're learning English and they're not English proficient, and I ask them if they read and they write in Spanish because I think at least you should be proficient in your own language, and they're not. And I remember when I was in ninth grade, I moved to the United States from Puerto Rico when I was 13. I was starting the ninth grade year. I had the worst accent in the world. Nobody could understand <laughs> a word I was saying. But I took a proficiency test in English, not in Spanish, in English. And I got in the 90th percentile. And I thought, and I'm not saying this to brag, I just thought, that's really weird. You know, how, how do I, you know, I can't even speak the language. <laughs> and if you think about it, knowing Spanish well, knowing Spanish literature, poetry, actually makes you more proficient in other languages. And it's something that I was always very grateful to my mother. She forced me to read poetry. She forced me to read the great books of literature in Spanish. And at the time, I hated it. But it has made my vocabulary, everything in my life better. So Hispanic families need to understand, become proficient not in one language, English only. Become proficient in both languages. Instead, well, we have a bunch of people who speak Spanglish, and they're proficient in neither language. And that's yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah. And you cannot be successful if you do that. Thank you. Uh, Treasurer yeah. Rosario, yeah. if I could just, uh, do you want to say something really quick? I, I just wanted to say something to the people, to the the young people, the children. Y lo voy a decir en español porque sí, por aquí a veces tenemos um, los ejemplos de mamás que en realidad te ayudaron, te promovieron, te, te, te dijeron que tú sí podías. Pero también a veces hay mamás que, por, que tienen cuatro hijos, cinco hijos, seis hijos, que están buscando que te gradúes para poder ayudarle a la casa, porque esa fue la situación mía. Y no quiere decir que tu mamá no te ama, y no quiere decir que no hay oportunidades para ti, todo lo contrario. Sí es un poco más difícil, pero sí se puede, sí se puede. Y yo quiero, cuando hablamos de libertad, quiero que estés libre de eso que tal vez te está deteniendo. No necesitas nada del gobierno para tú salir adelante. De eso yo soy la prueba. A mí nadie me dio un penny, a mí nadie me dio un loan, nadie me dio un préstamo, nadie me dio un grant, nadie me dio nada. Mis padres no me podían dar mi educación, pero yo lo hice. Yo me lo gané, yo lo trabajé. Y tú, joven, tú no necesitas que el gobierno te dé 500 dólares porque si no, no vas a tener éxito. No necesitas eso. Tú puedes hacerlo, tú puedes lograr. Y aunque no sea fácil, tú vas a tener toda una familia y toda una comunidad que te apoya y que te echa porras y que te dice si sí puedes. Y aquel que te pueda decir que no se puede está en el país equivocado porque aquí... Aquí sí se puede. Pero tú sabes una cosa. A ti y a todos, este país sí te dio una cosa muy especial. Te dio oportunidad. Es la oportunidad. Y piensa en donde estamos ahora. El pueblo americano aquí piensa que estamos en decline. Que no hay oportunidad. No hay trabajos, ¿eh? No hay oportunidad. Pero es triste que aquí pensamos en las, en las encuestas que, que no hay oportunidad. Pero es que líderes a través del mundo públicamente están diciendo que los Estados Unidos ya están en pique, están en decline. ¿Por qué? De nuevo, repito, estuvimos así antes con el presidente Jimmy Carter. ¿Y qué es lo que tuvo que pasar? Un cambio de liderazgo. 
que entiende y que entendió la grandeza del pueblo dominicano y otra vez trajo esas oportunidades. ¿no? Y lo único que hace falta es reemplazar a una administración bien intencionada quizás, pero que no entiende cómo funciona la economía, con una administración que sí sepa que lo que hace falta en este país es oportunidad, empleo, trabajo. Y con eso viene todo el resto. Con eso se puede financiar las cosas esenciales. Este siempre, esta siempre ha sido el país de la oportunidad. Estamos dispuestos. Congressman, I want to segue from exactly yeah. that comment. Mm -hmm. um, because fundamentally, yes, that's, that was great. Uh, fundamentally, I think the question that has to be made is, what is going to be the role of government uh, in our lives? And is, are we going to look to the government as the answer to every one of our social ills? Or do we still look at family and faith and community and the markets? I guess this will, this will be the last question because we're going to have to wrap it up. But in, and maybe we'll go down the line here. What is the fundamental role of government in our lives? Of course, it has one. But where is that balance where it starts to impose way too much on, on the private sector? Well, look, you know, it's, here's, none of this stuff is new. huh? There are places around the world where the government has taken a huge role has decided to you know, protect you from everything. You don't fall, you don't trip, you don't bump your head. Make sure you don't sweat. Make sure you don't, uh, you don't make any decisions. Uh, and they promise you that they're going to pro provide for everything. There's, that's, that's happening. Where? Greece? Spain? Last few years? Europe? That's worked out really well. They're bankrupt. Now they're having to cut their essential programs, their real programs. There's no job creation. There's no opportunity. This is the greatest country that God has ever allowed men and women to build on this planet. Why? Because our founding fathers understood the level of the playing field, allow human beings the dignity of work, the dignity of employment, the dignity of working hard risking it, providing for their families. And what happened? We became the wealthiest, the most powerful, the most generous country in the history of humanity. Not because government was huge. Because, no, because government was controlled. And the people became huge. And now they're trying to replace that <clears throat> with the Greece example. Hey, look, this is the greatest nation. We don't have to change America. We have to change Washington. That's right. <laughs> I love ¿Alguien más quisiera añadir? Ah, si no, 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 cada uno de contestar, si pueden, en 30 segundos o menos, o un minuto o menos. Eh, pero en su opinión, ¿cuál es el reto principal, el reto número uno que enfrentan los latinos durante los próximos cuatro años? Which, let me say this in English for those of you who, and I've asked them to wrap it up and keep the answers concise. In their opinions, what is the number one challenge facing Latinos in this country over the next four years? And you can come back in English and in Spanish in that way. El, el reto número uno es hacer la decisión en noviembre. Si van a votar por un partido que dice que está a favor de ustedes, pero que su política, que sus pólizas están destruyendo la economía, destruyendo sus familias, destruyendo las cosas que están sucediendo. O si van a votar por un equipo como Mitt Romney y Paul Ryan, que tiene ideas para superar a cada individuo a cada persona, a cada familia, a cada negocio. Ese es el reto que tenemos. ¿Qué tipo de futuro te queremos? ¿Queremos ser como España? ¿Queremos ser como Grecia? ¿Queremos ser como esos países europeos? ¿O queremos ser como hemos sido siempre? El mejor país en la historia del mundo. El mejor país que ha dado a latinos, a toda persona inmigrante que ha venido a los Estados Unidos, le ha dado oportunidades le ha dado beneficios, le ha dado una posibilidad de mejorar su vida. Esa es la decisión que tenemos que hacer 
Y como latinos, tenemos que decidir cuál de estos dos equipos nos va a dar esas mejores oportunidades. Y eso es lo que debemos hacer. Muchísimas gracias. Um, I think that the, oh, in English or in Spanish, no importa. That's fine. Um, well, I know Leslie's going to do it in English, so I'll do it in Spanish. <laughs> um, yo creo que el reto más importante para la comunidad latina es, este, es encontrar dónde está la oportunidad. Porque hasta cierto punto yo pienso que muchos de nosotros como comunidad, uh, como individuos, pensamos que ya no hay oportunidad que la oportunidad se encuentra en el gobierno, en el cheque que vamos a recibir de ellos. La, la oportunidad de crecer, de, de salir adelante, de tener nuestro propio empleo, uh, tal vez se nos está yendo de las, de las manos. Y yo quiero decirle a todo el mundo que eso no es cierto. En, en dos meses esto va a cambiar. Y la oportunidad que en realidad merecemos como comunidad viene y nos y, y me duele pensar que hay desesperanza en nuestra comunidad que tal vez esto es lo mejor que hemos podido lograr y quiero decirles que no que todavía falta mucho que nuestras contribuciones todavía van a ser muy muy grandes pero sí tenemos que cambiar este esta administración para mí ese es el reto que a veces exista la desesperanza cuando este es el, el país de la oportunidad. Este, tenemos que, que salir de eso. Sí se puede, sí hay y tenemos que encontrarla. Sin duda. El... Si escuchamos en las palabras de nuestro presidente, ¿cuál es el obstáculo más grande? Es el pueblo. ¿Ustedes se acuerdan cuando dijo que el pueblo de los Estados Unidos ahora se ha convertido un poco a Aragán? ¿Se acuerdan de eso? Las palabras del presidente de los Estados Unidos. O sea, esta administración cree que el reto, el reto que tiene la economía, el reto que tiene el crecimiento económico, la razón que no hay trabajo, porque bueno, el pueblo se ha puesto un poco a Aragán. El pueblo ya no es el mismo pueblo. Por lo tanto, el gobierno tiene que resolver todos los problemas. No, el reto número uno que existe en la creación de empleos, en la creación de riqueza, en la, en la creación de, bueno, de, de la grandeza de los Estados Unidos, hay un reto muy grande y se manifiesta en los intereses que está pagando el gobierno por la deuda, por el déficit, pero el reto más grande que enfrenta al pueblo, nuestra gente, que prohíbe que nuestra gente prospere, es el gobierno federal de los Estados Unidos. Es la política de esta administración. Este pueblo siempre ha prosperado. Este país siempre ha prosperado. Cuando la Casa Blanca nos dice que nuestro pueblo se ha hecho Aragán, le tenemos que contestar muy sencillamente, con todo el respeto, con todo el respeto que se merece ¿eh? el presidente de los Estados Unidos. Señor presidente, no. Nosotros no somos el problema. Nosotros no nos hemos puesto Aragán. El gobierno federal no entiende que si nos dejan tranquilos, si nos dejan trabajar, si nos proveen las oportunidades, los latinos una vez más, como siempre ha pasado, vamos a hacer lo que crea el crecimiento económico. Entonces, no, el reto más grande, desafortunadamente, son las políticas erróneas de la Casa Blanca. Cuando las reemplacemos en tres meses, ustedes verán, este es Estados Unidos, va a ser una vez más, no echarle la culpa a los otros porque no, porque no hay trabajo, no, 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 no. Los otros nos van a mirar, los otros países, y van a decir, wow, una vez más, los Estados Unidos es el país que siempre ha sido, y los latinos vamos a estar al frente de ese crecimiento económico.
<clears throat> I will be short and brief. Everything there, I think that has painted a beautiful story. This is exactly where America's moving. I think the biggest challenge, everything is to believe. Latinos have the biggest faith, the biggest heart, the biggest passion. And, and, and we have that bravery, and it is the bravery to challenge the way we think the system is supposed to be, that the status quo of the, this is always, always voted this way. We've always voted for this party. We've always, these people have been in our community, but that's not the policies that have supported us. It's the politics of dependency versus the politics of aspiration, and it's brave enough to take the step to see this vision outlaid. I think that is always the issue every day. Well, we want to thank the panel very much. I think uh, we have a very astute, very lucid, and, and I think highly intellectual panel, and we're just thrilled that uh, they could be with us today and we could address these issues head on. And we're passionate oh, wow. about yeah. the greatest nation that God has ever allowed men and women to build on this planet. Apasionados. Right. Yes. Por supuesto.